uh, drains being overblocked. And I don't think I have to say that this leads to a lot of issues such as infections, diseases. It's a really bad sanitation problem for the people living there. And especially for the young girls, there's also a big lack of safety and privacy. Whenever they go to the toilets, there's men hanging around. <coughs> the men get drunk, the men make nasty comments to the girls. Young boys stand outside, they try to peek in through the doors. Sometimes they film them. It's not a good situation. It's even happened that girls have been beaten up, raped, or even kidnapped while going to the toilets. This, of course, makes it even scarier for them to use them, especially at night. At night, if they cannot find an adult or somebody else to take them there, they don't go. They wait until morning. And in the morning, maybe there's a line of 20 people, and they have to rush to school, so they wait again and go to school instead. And just imagining that, not being able to go when you really need to. So in our project called Atnahak, meaning our right, we will train 20 girls from South Delhi so they can utilize the power of media to address and question the poor conditions of public toilets in their communities, the conditions that Catalina just described now. We want to empower them to demand from the local governments better facilities because that's their right. It's not just about health, it's not just a health issue, it's about self-esteem, and most importantly, it is their basic right. And that's why the project is called Abnahak, Our Right. And during a six-month long workshop, the girls will be taught photography, radio, and video skills. Together they will make a photo book, they will make a radio show, and a full-length documentary, and an exposition. The project has already started, and everything they make, they produce themselves. The material itself will help to spread awareness about their situation. <coughs> but it's not just about sanitation. Our project also wants the girls, we want to give the girls some chance to speak about other aspects of their life, other struggles that they're facing with every day. So for example, in our radio workshop, um, in the radio show that they produced, the girls talked about um, domestic violence. They spoke fiercely about the mistreatment they were um, experiencing back home by their own family members. Uh, for example, one girl, she told us in our radio station, and I quote, when I spoke to my mother and asked her, why does she hit me so much? Why does she have so much anger in her? And her answer was, she's also sustained a lot. And there is actually money being put aside by the local government for the upkeep of the toilets. But the people living in these areas, they don't know where the money is going because for sure it's not going where it should. And there are existing laws, such as the Right to Information Act, which gives citizens the right to go to the government and the municipalities and ask for documents. If they knew how to do this, they could see where is the money going. That's why the girls also receive legal training and leadership skills training, so that they are empowered enough to go down to the municipality, ask to see those documents, find out where the money is going, and demand a change. Now, armed with new knowledge, armed with new skills, the girls can become leaders in their communities and activists for change. They will inspire other girls and teach them too. That's why we hope that we can improve their situation, not only for now, for these 20 young girls, but also for their communities at large. That's how we hope that teaching technological skills can have long-term impact and positive effects on young women's lives. Well, yeah, thank you from us and from the girls of South Delhi. Six minutes and eight seconds. You are now the official leaders. Um, can I have some questions for the jury? Yes. I would like to know how did you find out about the situation of the people in the slums of South Delhi? Uh, one of our colleagues from where we work, she traveled to India, and through that we got in contact with the what we mentioned before, Feminist Approach to Technology, who has a media center. And through them, we could get in contact with youth activists at the center. And there, the girls themselves also chose this topic. So it's really a collaboration. We're here now from the Netherlands, but this project has been made together with girls there. So it's 
just, not just us. Sorry, I just want to say that that is a very important point that we're from Amsterdam and we do a project from uh, in Delhi. So we don't just go there and pretend like we know what their problems are and what they're facing and really go to the local organization and work with them because we've, they've been working with them for a very long time. That's, that's my thing. Yes. I have 20 boxes on my little form here. One is called design, one is called interactivity. These are the more technical aspect or the distribution aspect of, for all this content that has been created. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, like the radio show that has already been made, it's online. If anybody wants a link, uh, we can give that to you later. Uh, they also, through FAT, the, our partner, we always try and work with uh, for example, a radio station there, or somebody with knowledge there. The exposition will be held there, and we still don't know where, but it always has to come from the girls themselves and the community. So we always try and pick places that uh, that they are, that their communities go to, that they know, and yeah, that's uh, the that problem. Thank you very much. Uh, a, a round of applause. Uh, all right. <laughs> Moving on, we're going to move to a new category now. We're going to move to Create Your Culture. And I'd like to invite um, In a Multicultural Chip, the Cyborg Project, up. Uh, Now, small fact, um, you guys are working on a project um, with Neil Harmson, and there's a past winner who actually... Adam, did you win the award with this, this project? You might have won this award with this project. So, this is uh, coming double around again, isn't it? This is quite easy. It's history repeating itself. Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Joey Camara from the Montessori Chief Cyber Project team. Uh, and well, uh, our project is about color perception and cyber. And first of all, I, I will start uh, with a video.
Okay. Well, uh, what you saw here are the different parts of the video, which are the same that will come up here now. Um, the man that was on the video is Neil Hargerson. Neil is a sonochromatic cyborg. Maybe most of you will be asking yourselves what this means. Well, Neil has a condition in which he can't see any of the colors, so he sees everything in black and white in grayscale. And that's why he wears an electronic device on his head that plays a different sound for each color he points at. So you point to yellow and it maybe it sounds uh, A or green sounds C. So um, maybe some of you may, may know him because he was here in 2004. Because or a DEI book and Adam Montana, they won the Eurofix Award in 2004. Mm -hmm. And well, Neil is the Cyborg Foundation founder, mm -hmm. and he's also an icon for the cyborg movement and the main inspiration for our project. The goal of our project is to demonstrate how new technologies can help people with disabilities um, uh, and how they can exploit these disabilities in an artistic way like Neil does. Um, the first part of our project is Neil's personal website. In this website you can find his artwork, he does some color scores with different colors that he sees and other pieces of art as well. Uh, you can also find uh, his agenda because he does lots of talks and well his artwork, basically. Uh, the next part is the Cyborg Foundation portal. The Cyborg Foundation is a, an organization that fights for the rights of cyborg people. And in this portal you can find information about, um, well, information and support about uh, the cyborg world and cyborg news, and maybe even how to become a cyborg. Uh, our goal with this uh, with this webpage, uh, the other with the Cyborg Foundation webpage, is to transform it in a social network for people with cyborg needs so they can help themselves because at the moment it's just an information website. Okay, so next up is one of the most interesting and lengthy parts of the project. This is the feature documentary that. Uh, my colleague Roger uh, directed with Isaac Martinez and Pepperes, and it's a documentary about the life of Neil Harbison. It tells the story of uh, how Neil became a cyborg and the story of the eyeball. And well, it, it has been aired on TVs in Russia, Japan, Italy and Spain, and it has won uh, an award in the Docs Barcelona Festival. Um, this is part of a larger project, an interactive uh, project, which has an interactive documentary that you can see here, a screenshot of it. It's a web page where you can see the documentary in parts, and you can learn about the story as well and you can even play an interactive game that we developed. It's a piano that creates the same artwork that Neil does, it's based on his artwork. So you play whatever song and or a song and you can have the visual representation of it in colors like this. These are community created, um, well user generated con content, uh, so anyone can make one of these and share it with all the other users. Um, then there is the web application. We made a web app that lets you access this same content, uh, the documentary, on a mobile device. And well, after doing all this interactive experience, we felt that we needed to make something to so people could experience what Neil feels in hearing colors instead of seeing them. So we decided to develop a mobile app. This is the iBook, the iBook app. 
It's a free Android application um, available now on Google Play. And well, it does exactly the same thing that Neil's iBook does. So you point the camera to a color, and it will play a sound depending on each color. Um, if you want, you can try it now. Well, it has over 8,000 downloads and a rating of over 4.5 stars so far. And we only uploaded it this September. Now, my friends Mikael and Monica will let you try it if you want. <laughs> There's, we have planned to make an iOS version as well, but, well, it's still in development, so it will come later. And maybe other mobile platforms will have it as well. It has been very successful so far, as you can see. Well, so, uh, should we wait for them? <laughs> Okay, so um, after doing all this, uh, this is well, this is what we've done until now, and uh, we think we still have lots to do. Uh, some things we have thought are, for example, uh, an interactive installation where we can showcase the different applications and interactive devices that we have made, and there's also an augmented reality app planned. And finally, we are thinking of making a Google Glass app, which is already in first stages of development and would do exactly the same, but uh, even in a more intuitive way. Uh, so that's it. Um, and what do you think? Would you like to be a cyborg? <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the jury? Adam, you, you surely have a question. Come on. Kai's got a question. Kai. Kai, is this question more than three words? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, you have a lot of stuff here, game, app, uh, documentary, websites. What is actually that we should assess choosing winner? The entire cyborg world or what is participating in this competition? Okay, so mainly I know it's a lot of things, but uh, this is a, a big transmedia interactive project, so all the different small parts should take into account in the decision. Um, well, and that <laughs> the documentary is probably the most uh, interesting, well, lengthy part that we, we made, but uh, you can't see it. Well, you can watch it on the web page, but you couldn't see it now because, of course, we don't have time. But <laughs> you can actually watch the documentary in the Venetian Hotel. It's on the, it's on the TVs there. And what about your users? How they feel using your products? I mean, do you have some feedback from them in this user's world? Well, we have lots of good feedback from the app, the mobile application, because uh, Neil has a lot of fans, so they too want to experience what he does, and we have had a lot of feedback from him. And uh, Well, the Cyber Foundation plans to make other devices as well, but uh, this, will, well, this will become a reality when we launch the social um, website because then people will be able to help each other to create new devices. Um, so uh, from what I got, the idea is that you get a positive feeling about what a cyborg is and so on to experience that. My question would be, um, you definitely um, define a cyborg as someone with a disability and it turns him more or less to normal. Um, how do you draw the border to this whole transhumanity? the uh, transhumanism movement, where it goes about highly enhancing your abilities, like being aware about all kinds of things, and um, how, how is that playing into your documentary? 
Okay, well, uh, I, uh, when I did the description, I meant uh, what our project is about, which is helping people with disabilities with new technologies. And, uh, well, um, uh, making the cyber world more known for everyone because it's not very, a not very popular topic. Uh, but, um, uh, sorry, I forgot your question again. Yeah, okay. Well, we have seen recently with Google Glass or <coughs> devices like this that maybe this, well, this will <coughs> most certainly be the future. And we think that if everyone uses this, then it will be normal. So we've even seen smart wigs or <laughs> devices that go in the finger. Well, lots of things like this, and we think it will be normal in the future, so it will be okay. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, round of applause. Oh, one more question, sorry. Oh, I did see that, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned your target, which is sensibilization about the cyborg, the cyborg world, what, whether it's enhancing or compensating disability. I'm curious about that now. And then you present your project, and it's basically a really big show about this one particular guy. I'm missing the path from your target and the impact that this one person will have. What, what's, how do you want to fill this gap? <laughs> well, as I said, uh, Neil is an icon for the cyborg movement, and we based our project on him because we thought that we would reach a larger public because the app, for example, does exactly the same that his device does and you can create his artwork as well. So we thought that uh, we could centralize the cyber code. Um, uh, if we wanted to centralize the car cyber code, we would reach a larger public by um, doing things with Neil. Thank you very much. Round of applause. Um, we will switch the on uh, in the Creek Your Own Culture. Can I invite Spun Out? After this presentation, there will be a 15 minute break for coffee. So bear with us 15 minutes, give your full attention with the thought that you'll be going off and having coffee after this and more biscuits if there's any biscuits left. Peter, are there any biscuits left? There are biscuits, dates, cakes, apples, and juice. There's juice as well, ladies and gentlemen. There's juice. <laughs> Digwich, Sean Boca, Sam and Dalton, August Dome, over in uh, Spun Out, Ross, Aaron. Um, how's it going? Um, where do young people learn about life? Where do you learn about life? It's a question that I want you to consider for a second. Where do we learn about life? showing us that young people are learning more and more about life online. Um, it's the third highest 
uh, educator for young people behind peers at school, so they report themselves according to the uh, to UNICEF in Ireland. Um, and that's where spunout.ie comes in. Um, we've been working with young people um, in a number of different ways uh, over a number of years, via desktop, mobile, social media channels. And um, what we do is we provide information that's professional, it's youth focused and up to date. So we try and provide young people with information about life um, in a medium that suits them and fits with them. Um, and we work with hundreds of thousands of young people every year on this. Um, and, and basically, we try and make sure that they have the information to make healthy deci decisions in their own lives. And this is our webpage here in, in the background. Um, the, the, the suggestion of the presentation was that we uh, introduce um, ourselves. There's four of us who work on the team, but that's not really who we are. So I want some other people to tell you uh, who they are. Actually, I might see if I can boost the sound up on this actually a little bit, if possible. Does anyone know if you're able to raise your volume? Or just put the mic and all Yeah, put the mic. Oh, that's the giver. different types, different creeds, different genders is who we are. And, and basically we, we're nominated in the category for building your own culture. And, and so we had a bit of a eureka moment and we kind of said, oh my god, oh my god, it was something really, really basic that we could do. And it's not a principle based on any kind of a digital agenda, but it's a very basic principle based on, on youth work is, is where we found what we try and do. And that's facilitating young people to have a say in political and soci social issues arming them with facts and trusting them. That's the essence of working with young people in Europe today and all over the world, is actually placing trust in young people's ability to create change if we resource them, um, if we arm them with facts and we facilitate them to have a say on, on political and social issues. Um, so what actually happens when you do that? Um, I just want to give you some examples because you're probably wondering what, how do we actually use technology to create that change? Um, so we do it in three key areas. Um, these areas are health and life information, making sure young people are able to express their opinions online and make sure that has ripples offline as well, and trying to create social change overall in society. So I'm gonna give you a few examples. This first example, and hopefully it fits with some of the Millennium Development Goals, which is something you have to be aware of in, in terms of the European Youth Award as well. So this first one's about cyberbullying. And again, this video was created on a budget of six euro, um, and was created by six young people, and uh, it's had over a million impressions um, worldwide, so I'll give you a quick look.
So, basically simply working with young people, developing a message they're comfortable with, using a medium that they're comfortable with, um, and showing that they're not passive. When it comes to bullying, we talk a lot about bullying, that it's a problem we have to solve, and we, the adults of the world, but no, young people can solve themselves by not being bystanders. Another health and life example and how we've used technology is we ran a campaign um, with about 60 young people called the Underground Protection Racket, where we distributed over 3,000 condoms in the streets of Dublin city centre between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m., which, if any of you have ever been to Dublin City, between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. On, on a Friday night is an experience, I'll tell you that much. But we built a buzz online using existing platforms, Facebook and Twitter and Google+, telling people that we were coming, and they didn't really know what it was about. But what we, the aim was there to provide um, a, a health intervention where young people are having the most risky types of health intervention and using um, technology to complement that. In terms of sharing opinions, um, Basically, we are quite a platform for young people to share their opinions and views on social issues relatively unedited. And it's very, it's a simple blogging concept, but what we have is the crowdsource power because of the young people that visit our site um, to give it a boost and to trust young people. Whereas when you blog, it might only have a minimal impact, but we bring young people together to collaborate, to share their stories. This one example is from a young lad called Adam Harris, and Adam shared his experience of having autism. Um, and he was sick of being labelled in society as disabled, because he's not, he had autism, it's not who he is. And by writing this article, Adam, he got a lot off his chest and he got a lot personally. But the article went viral in Ireland and um, Adam ended up talking to one of Ireland's leading TV shows, the most viewed TV shows called um, The Late Late Show, uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was quite cool as well. So, social change and momentum, young people's opinions starting off online and rippling throughout society. Um, and how we kind of moved to that creating change as well, we use the platform as well to connect to young people around loads of different topics. We were in the Irish Parliament, which is called the Oireachtas, um, last week, whereby we were talking around um, uh, youth unemployment issues. We went with a team of 10 young people. We spread the message through online platforms as well and brought young people direct to decision makers to engage with them around creating social change. We also invest in, and, um, in young people's social change projects and we fund them to do this. And, online projects to create change, and we've invested in Avril Clark, Avril Clark, who's up on screen here, and she's created a website called Better Than Noodles, which is trying to encourage students to um, eat cheaper but healthier at the same time. So we invest cash and um, resources in young people to do that. We also invest in young people to be the change makers themselves and bring young people together in an annual event called the Spun Out Academy of Activism, which we live stream. We're training up that activist to be that change in, in, in their lives, as I think uh, Paul referred to earlier, Gandhi's quote, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, and we also try and collaborate with um, tech companies. So a couple of weeks ago, we held a hackathon in Facebook's European HQ in Dublin, where we brought together 60 young hackers from across Ireland. Um, and we used our web platform. Uh, we hacked spunout.ie. We've got a database of support services on there. And we got the hackers to take over the website. We built an API. And they took our database of help services, which was really crap, and they made it into developed into three different uh, Facebook-based apps. And we're actually working with Facebook I'm in California next week in Menlo Park to look at how we can bring that forward um, and, and develop that a lot more. So we pack a punch. Um, we've got a kind of quite a significant impact in Ireland. Um, we get a, a, over a million visits to the website each year, five million page views. Our YouTube channel has about two hundred and fifty thousand views at the moment. We have about 300 um, new youth um, written articles this year. Um, we work with about 1,400 young people offline um, every year as well, and uh, a few other bits and pieces. Um, I know I'm tight in time, but I'm going to squeeze this last video in because uh, a young person that we work with, Laura Gaynor, actually made this video for today as well. Um, she wants to show the impact um, that Spun Out might have in the future. Uh, so I'm going to show you this one. I'm going to wrap it up then.
so by um, arming young people with information, so there's uh, an information problem out there, um, they can create great and create positive social change by just using their voices. Again, these images were done this week by a young person that we work with. So, Irving and Malgoth, thank you very much. Now I hold the title of the longest talk at 12 minutes 17, so congratulations. Um, I'll take a few questions. Have we got any questions from the jurors? Yes, Francesca, then, yeah. No, you're not really a juror, but you've got your hand up anyway, so. I think it's going to be fine like that. Um, so what has been done to now, and did you have any funding for that? Yeah, we have. Um, we have uh, a model of funding that is has two streams at the moment. The first stream is for a small amount from government. We receive about 20% from government. The rest of the funding is philanthropic, so it comes from an uh, Irish-American billionaire called Chuck Feeney and his fund called the Atlantic Philanthropies. But that's finishing up in December this year, so in a few days. Um, so we're trying to diversify our funding streams at the moment to make sure that we can keep going. But we do have a plan B and C without funding as well to make sure that the platform can remain, because we feel it's really important that it stays. Um, so we've got plan A, B and C. If we don't get cash in, it can run on a limited service. All we need to pay for is the server, um, and we can run on a volunteer-led capacity as well. So we're ready for it. Nice. Yeah, on the, on the one hand, you were talking about having like a good message and um, getting people to do a positive decision. On the other side, what I see that a huge part of your success is like crowdsourced information. How do you actually make that these two things really play together? Yeah, it's it's well, what we do is we kind of um, we make sure that we we professionally create health and life information. So we're, when we're creating information around sexual health, we're working with doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals to, to build that content, and then we work with young people around what that content says, so it speaks to them in a way um, that isn't I'm a doctor, I'm telling you what to do, but is a peer-led approach. And we use platforms that exist already, private Facebook groups, to crowdsource young people's opinions. We use the site to bring those opinions together to comment on it. And sometimes they might contradict and they might have opposing views, but that's okay because what it's about is starting a dialogue for change. So it's okay if they contradict each other a little bit. It's about talking about the social topics. Does that make sense? Cool, thanks. <laughs> What I like about this project is the execution is pretty perfect. You also see it in the impact preservation, and medium. it's not easy to reach. Um, but it, can you tell me what's what's the innovation aspect of the platform? How do you consider what's make your project innovative? What makes our project innovative is young people. Um, there's not a culture within Europe of really listening to and working with young people. What we're doing is we're not innovating in terms of the digital aspect of what we do, but we're innovating in terms of how we link that into young people. Our expertise is, is working with young people and facilitating them to create that content and training them to, to be that change in the world. And what we do is we plug into expert platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, and so on. The prevailing platforms where young people are, instead of trying to reinvent stuff, um, where young people won't be, or where we have to try and bring young people, we bring health and life information to them on the platforms that they engage with. And we use their expertise to build on that. That's where we think we're innovative. Thank you very much. Good answer. Um, 15 minutes break, people. If you go 15 minutes, I will send Peter personally out to turn you back in. So 15 minutes, and we'll start the next section of the award. Thank you very much. We have five more presentations after the break, okay? Thank <laughs> you. 